Hello, and welcome to this recorded e-learning on the use of global timing constraints. My name is Frank Nelson. I'll be your instructor for this module. This module introduces the primary timing constraints used by all Xilinx customers, the global timing constraints. Please note that this topic is included as part of the essentials of FPGA design course. Timing constraints are fundamental and essential for users to get their performance objectives met. However, the use of global timing constraints is only the first step. You will also need to use path-specific timing constraints, which is a part of the Designing for Performance course. We recommend that you take the time to attend these courses to complete your learning and help make your design successful. After completing this module, you'll be able to apply global timing constraints to a simple synchronous design, and you'll be able to make those constraints with the Xilinx Constraints Editor. This module is important if you're going to be attempting to complete any Xilinx FPJ design, so be sure you understand and follow the suggestions made in this module. In this example, we took a small and simple design and implemented it without the use of any timing constraints or pin assignments. This is shown on the left. Note the logical structure of the placement of logic and the placement of the I.O. pins. The implementation tools do a good job of placing and writing the design without using timing constraints. From this example, you can see that the logic is grouped close together in the middle to provide a good internal frequency and minimize the clock skew. Likewise, the I.O. pins are placed together so that pins from the same component end up next to each other. This makes the most sense since they are related. Note that the tools do not anticipate any ground bounce problems. The tools do not know when the signals will be toggled or how many signals may change simultaneously. It is left to the designer to be certain that you try to disperse switching outputs that are switching simultaneously to help avoid any problems with ground bounce. To help with that, the Architecture Wizard and Pinahead Recorded E-Learning Module discuss how to place I.O. pins efficiently so you reduce the risk of creating a ground bounce problem. Now, on the right-hand side, the same design was implemented with global timing constraints. This required the use of input, output, and internal timing constraints, which forced the implementation tools to move the logic closer to the I.O. pins to improve on-chip and off-chip timing. Now note that the logic is placed closer to the I.O. pins due to the input and output timing constraints. Timing constraints are used to communicate performance objectives to the implementation tools or software, which in turn is used to place and route the design such that the design will meet your timing objectives. When timing constraints are used, the placement and routing solution can be very different. In this case, the pin placement is almost identical to the original implementation without using timing constraints. However, the placement of the logic is significantly different. The net result is a faster performing design at the expense of a slightly longer implementation time. Timing constraints are used to define your performance objectives. Tight timing constraints will increase your compile time, depending on the speed of your device and design. Unrealistic timing constraints, often called over-constraining, will cause the implementation tools to stop. If your design does not proceed through MAP and you receive a message warning you of an unrealistic constraint, you will need to use your synthesis report or the post-MAP static timing report to determine whether your constraints are realistic. After implementing, review the post place and route static timing report to determine whether your performance objectives were met. If the timing constraints were not met, use the timing analyzer utility from the ISE software to generate a timing report. This will enable you to determine the cause of the timing failure. Causes can include many possible reasons, such as too many logic levels, that is LUTs in series, which is caused by poor HDL coding, perhaps a high fanout net delay, or even a need to pipeline the data path are some prime examples of causes of the tools not being able to meet your timing objectives. Now, you can learn more about interpreting timing reports in the Achieving Timing Closure module in the Designing for Performance course. Likewise, the same course shows you how to use the timing analyzer and all of its features. 
Before we proceed to introduce you to the global timing constraints and the delay paths they cover, it's very important that you understand the possible path endpoints you can have. Once you start to understand how the implementation tools look at your design in terms of path endpoints, making the best timing constraints is very easy. While global timing constraints are very simple, Understanding possible path endpoints is useful when you learn about path-specific timing constraints. Like global constraints, path-specific constraints are important to properly communicate your timing objectives to the implementation tools. Simply put, path endpoints are I.O. paths and synchronous elements. Synchronous elements can include flip-flops, latches, RAMs, DSP slices, and shift register LUT resources. Note all the synchronous elements, of course, are synchronous because, of course, they have a clock port. Path endpoints do not include LUTs, NETs, or any other purely asynchronous element, so basically anything without a clock port. Now, most new designers would expect us to say LUTs can be a path endpoint, but they are a purely asynchronous element, so this would not be helpful. But note that if a LUT is reconfigured as a RAM or a shift register LUT, then it uses a clock port and then becomes synchronous and thus, at that point, can be a path endpoint. So when you think about improving the timing of your design, remember that you are first grouping path endpoints. And these are the only types of path endpoints that can be grouped. Again, that's IO pads and synchronous elements. Once path endpoints are grouped, and these are grouped easily by global timing constraints, the next step is to specify a timing objective between the groups. Global timing constraints are easy to make because they save you from grouping path endpoints. This means you don't have to be specific about which path endpoints are part of a specific group. As you will see, that is because global timing constraints group elements based simply on the clock signal that is connected to those synchronous elements. There are three global timing constraints. The first and most significant because it covers 80 plus percent of internal delay paths is the period constraint. The elements it groups are simply the synchronous elements it's attached to. In this example, there is one clock and it attaches to five flip-flops. This defines these flip-flops as both a group of sources and a separate group of destinations. So in this example, there would be three delay paths that would be constrained because they would cover the paths that go from the group of sources to the group of destinations, which happens to be the same group of flip-flops. As you can see, the delay paths cover from flip-flop 1 to 2, flip-flop 2 to 3, and flip-flop 4 to 5. This should also teach you that there is no relationship between the number of path endpoints and the number of constrained paths. The number of path endpoints and delay paths is simply design dependent and that can be very complex or it can be very simple. It'll just depend on your design. Now, once you have made your timing constraints, the constraints editor will store them in your UCF file, that is your user constraints file. This is the same file your pin assignments will be placed. The implementation tools will then use your timing constraints to manipulate the place around solutions so that your design will meet all of your timing objectives. This requires the implementation tools to be very sophisticated. That's because accurately measuring the internal delay is not just a huge database of static numbers. The implementation tools also must be able to properly factor in the clock skew associated with the clock net's internal routing delays. The tools also need to be aware from your net list that not all of your synchronous elements will be toggled on the same clock edge, so that has to be anticipated. And it also has to be aware of your defined clock's duty cycle and the input clock jitter. When you couple that jitter with the performance characteristics of a DCM or PLL you may be using to derive a clock internal signal, then suddenly that calculation is a little more complex. So all of these factors are built into the implementation tools when completing a static timing analysis, and that's done for each iteration. Remember, you may have to do multiple iterations depending upon your speed grade and how tight your timing objectives are. Don't forget that all this may have to be completed many, many times to find a place around solution that will meet all your timing needs. Suddenly, now you have a great deal of respect for the ISE software. 
In the end, the point is that these tools are built to try and anticipate many of the factors that go into affecting the internal delays of your design. You should have some confidence now that this software performs a lot of hard, accurate work on your behalf.